o'clock. Let's call tonight's meeting to order. We'll be yeah. with the Pledge I of Allegiance. That. I thought it was the one down next to the Is that where it is? Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We are going to begin tonight's meeting with a public hearing on the proposed volunteer firefighter and ambulance personnel tax abatement ordinance amendments. These are proposed amendments to an ordinance that gives a tax abatement to the volunteers who serve our town in the fire department and ambulance service. We're going to have our usual public audience after this hearing, so if anyone wants to speak on anything other than the uh, the ordinance, I'll ask that you wait until, until the uh, public audience portion. Um, would anyone like to speak on the ordinance tonight? Yes. Uh, good evening. My name is Kevin Kowalski. I represent the uh, Sinsbury Volunteer Firefighters. I'm Deputy Chief. And uh, I just wanted to say that we are definitely uh, in favor of this these technical changes into the ordinance. And I want to thank Maria and, and Melissa for assisting us and getting us through the, the process of, of getting this repaired. Basically, what we uh, are showing is that the tax abatement is a very progressive um, uh, situation where it comes with helping us with retention and recruitment. The, it's, it's progressive in a way that the longer you stay in, the more benefit you get. In other towns, you walk in the door, uh, six or seven months later, you could get the $1,000 abatement. In our particular case, we ask that you be in for five years, you get uh, two years, you get $500, and then at five years you get $1,000. So you do have to commit to a certain period of time, and it maintains retention and also uh, good response protocols. So with that, there were actually three items that <clears throat> excuse me, needed to be remedied. One was a technical error that occurred the last adjustment in 2016. Uh, that section was referring to the 25-year benefit. In other words, if a, per a firefighter volunteers for 25 years, he is able to, uh, to receive that tax abatement after he retires, which 25 years of prevailing wage of a firefighter is a lot of money. So the $1,000 is, is, a, is a very good benefit, and we can keep them to 25 years. It, it would be, it's terrific. Uh, that was, and that was voted in back in 2007, but during a technical change in 2016, having nothing to do with that, it was not, it was left off the ordinance document when it was sent back, and then when it was posted, it wasn't on it. So it created a bit of a, a challenge for us. The next uh, was to eliminate the possibility of a firefighter receiving a benefit from Simsbury while volunteering for another town. It's uh, pretty self-evident why we want that changed. Uh, we, we really want the people to volunteer for us. If they're living in the community, we, we'd like to have them volunteer for us and get, the, get that benefit. The last one was a clarification of <clears throat> once the person achieves their benefit and, for instance, they decide to move but still have uh, property here in, in the community that's taxable, that they can continue to receive the abatement even if as long as they occupy the building and own the building. So there is some, some caveats with, with the allowance of that. But again, I, I uh, encourage you to pass this these changes to the ordinance, and I thank you very much for your support on it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks Chief. Thanks, Kevin. Would anyone else like to speak on this? Okay. Is there a, a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. The public hearing is closed. Uh, now time for our regular uh, public audience. Joan. Who is bouncing around? Code 26 Whitcomb Drive. On Tuesday, May 14, 2019, the taxpayers will vote at the budget referendum with an increase in spending and an increase in the mill rate. Now that the town is under management of professional town manager, the expectations were that the budget would be streamlined with a reduction in expenditures. The Board of Selectmen spending budget increased 14.03%. 14, 14 
After hours of board of finance meeting, many operating expenses were paid with cash from overtaxing the taxpayers in prior years with many favorable assumptions. The budget submission included increased investment income by $150,000, transfer $1.5 million from assigned fund balance to unassigned fund balance, transfer $850,000 from general fund unassigned fund balance to the health insurance service, utilize an assumption of 6.75% for the pension plans and other post-employment benefit plan. Transfer $130,000 out of the CNR five-year playback and into the police operating budget for police vehicles. Replace $606,500 in cash, financing for paving and bonding financing. The Greenway improvements in the amount of $100,000 to be funded by cash. Approve pay, uh, pavement management in the $1,185,000 to be funded with some cash. Sidewalk resurfacing in the amount of $200,000 to be funded with cash. Accounting system in the amount of $350,000 to be funded with cash. There is another $1,000,000 in unassigned funds to be used as a slush fund. The Board of Education has presented a budget with 2.50 increase. The per pupil expenditure is 17147 The Board of Education $200,000 School Facilities Master Plan and Reconfiguration Study has shown enrollment trends decreasing over the years. Elementary schools declined 27.2%, middle school declined 28.2%, high school enrollment declined 12.4%, and an on-site walkthrough, general observations, and analysis of conditions found significant deficiencies that require immediate remediation in all schools that require attention a scale of one to five that will require significant future expenditures. The present mill rate is 36.42 and 1.17 mill rate for the fire department. The total mill rate is 37.59. This budget if this budget is approved, the mill rate will be increased to 37.32 with an increase for fire department that has not yet been determined. According to the Hartford Current, the real estate values of Simsbury Homes by section in 2018 and 2017, tariff will decline 50%, 44.5%. WETOG declined 57.9%, 8.8%. West Simsbury declined 9.1%, 1.39%, and Simsbury increased 2.6% and 1.3%. The Board of Selectmen has voted for abatements, reductions, and waivers of fees, reducing future revenues from many businesses and private organizations. All the fiscal indicators for Simsbury leads one to believe that we are no longer competitive for economic development. Budgets will increase in the future and the taxpayers will continue to feed the monster unless we hold our elected officials accountable and reject the inflated budgets. With a professional town manager in Simsbury, one would conclude that professional management would streamline the budget and boards and commissions not increase them. According to town staff, we have over 40 standing appointed and elected boards and commissions with many additional subcommittees to recommend policy to the Board of Selectmen. This has become a logistical nightmare and extremely time consuming. There has been an increase in grievances in several departments with two police sergeants receiving identical reprimands. After bringing concerns over the increase in zoning violations with a proliferation of signs on the weekend, the planning staff suggested that zoning compliance officer use 35 hours of work on a flex schedule to work, occasionally on weekends. This should increase compliance. Now that Deputy First Selectman Chris Kelly will not be running for re-election, I would like to be assured that there would be a comparable replacement to take his place. There are several people interested in being nominated to the position in the Democratic Party. Recently, Elaine Lang's name was mentioned. Elaine Lang was involved in a two-car motor vehicle accident on April 26, 2019, where she was arrested for failure to drive in a proper lane and driving under the influence. Both cars were towed. Lang was given a, quote, standardized field sobriety test, end quote, and failed the test. There is no mention of the use of a breathalyzer or alcohol levels. However, it would appear to me with all of her accomplishments and service, her judgment and decisions are questionable 
and she should not be nominated as a candidate for the Board of Selectmen. Tim Taberski was approached to the That's line five minutes, to John. line the Please tennis courts up. at Simsbury Farms with pickleball. Pickleball has become most active recreational sport. <laughs> However, Bill Donahue, a contracted tennis instructor, has vehemently opposed living, lining the courts. Tennis is a recreational sport as is pickleball. Players can distinguish between tennis lines and pickleball lines when playing. Many towns have lined the tennis courts with pickleball with increased play. Bill Donahue should not bully the recreation department in denying the public a growing recreational sport. All of my comments will be posted on uh, Simsbury Patch, Twitter at Joan Co., and Newsfeed on Facebook. Thank you for giving me that extra time. Of course. Rush, 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 rush. So you can speak quickly. Go. Thank you, Joan. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> anybody else for public audience tonight? Yeah. Hi, my name is Mike Rinaldi. Um, I reside at uh, Pinnacle Mountain Road. I received um, this in the mail, this flyer. Uh, I'm sure it's put up at the town. Uh, quite informative. Uh, sort of embarrassment. Um, I don't know who put this out, but it's a year-by-year -year budget data. Anybody who would put this out, send it to the public. <laughs> I don't know what kind of intelligence anybody would have to do something like that without having an hysteric saying in a, in a subscript an explanation of why these changes are so dramatic. I mean, a person picking up this and saying well, operating budget in 15-16 is uh, 0.84 and then in 16-17 it's 3.3 and in 17-18 it goes up to 1588, and then 1819, it drops to minus 7. And then it goes up this year to 14. There has to be an explanation. And there is an explanation for this. But nobody gave one to the public. They just put this out. Anybody who reads this said, there's something wrong here. There's nothing wrong here. It's just how you put your data together. And it's unacceptable. You can't do that. Now. Getting to the next line, it gives the operating budget and the Board of uh, Education budget an average of 10 years and an average of five years. I just looked up some data. It's quite alarming. The cumulative inflation rate for years 2017 was 2.11%. These are government data. The last 12 months, it's 1.91%. Cumulative inflation rate over the past five years, 7.8%. For the Board of Education, 24.75%. That's unacceptable by any means. Board of Education, they do a little bit better. Their budget, cumulative budget increase over the past five years, 7.8%. The inflation rate over this period of time, 7.8%. One has to understand that the Board of Education over the past 14 years has dropped 22 percent in enrollment, 9.8 percent over the past five years. So what we have here are two budgets. The flyer doesn't explain the year-to-year -year budget data discrepancies. That should be explained by an hysteric saying how these things occurred. People are going to go vote tomorrow. I doubt if anybody understands this. And probably after public audience, you probably could explain it because there is a real explanation for this. I think Mr. Askham knows probably more than anyone the explanation. However, we can have on the board of, of, of selectmen and the town manager who manages our budgets to have over the past five years a 24.75% cumulative uh, inflation in their budget. Now, when Mr. Kelly um, was the proponent for a town manager form of government, and I was not opposed to a town manager form of government,
but I saw no reason to change. I thought our government worked pretty well the way it was. <clears throat> However, they said, um, you know, Mr. Kelly said, it's going to be cost effective. It's going to be cheaper to have a town manager run our government than it was the present government. Well, let's look at the statistics. First selectman, director of administrative service, assistant director of administrative service, and executive secretary. Total budget, $283,000. Town manager, assistant town manager, public administrative assistant. This is a change from the uh, executive secretary. And now an accountant, $435,000. It's not less, Mr. Kelly. It's more. And what have we got over this period of time? <clears throat> well, we got a foul ball called strike one last year. We got a budget over four and a half percent, highest we've had in five years. And then we got this year, budget of over four and a half percent. That was a fastball, strike two. Now next year, we get a budget of 4.5 and more. That's strike three. And in baseball, you're out. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Rinaldi. Uh, anybody else would like to speak in public audience tonight? Susan. Uh, Susan Messino, 41 Madison Lane. Um, I have five items, but I'm going to be super quick. Um, number one, maybe some people were at the Farmington on Saturday for the Wild and Scenic River dedication. dedication. This has been um, looming for a long time that we have been on the cusp of being the only town with the East Coast Greenway, a National Scenic Trail, and a Wild and Scenic River all in the same town. So it's finally true, which is really nice. Um, so I wanted to just acknowledge that accomplishment. Um, second, on June 1st is Trails Day, where there's going to be hikes all over Connecticut. And there's going to be one here. It's a special hike um, for veterans, their families, and current military. And most everyone has a veteran in their family. So I would say it's pretty much for anyone. Um, if I go, you can just say you're with me. And it's going to start at 9 AM at um, the hike to Hubline Tower. Um, and you can join at the top of the yellow trail if you can't walk all the way from the bottom. Um, number three, I'd like to announce the um, Concerts on the Green series this summer at the Historical Society, um, which is a collaboration between the Grange and the Historical Society. On June 8th, we are having um, our first annual concert titled SHS at SHS, which is kind of a concert that we want to do in honor of all of our seniors that are graduating. It's always going to be around the time of high school graduation, and one of my goals has been to get this kind of music with professional musicians um, in town um, at an affordable time, affordable cost when anybody can attend. So the concert's going to be from 3 to 5. Um, it's going to feature Chris Tofield, who's based in Los Angeles. He's a very well-known, nationally known blues um, guitar player. It says he has a unique and masterful guitar and a soulful um, singing style. He's originally from Torrington, Connecticut. So one thing we've tried to do is get musicians that are originally from Connecticut but are now kind of all over. Um, that event will also be in conjunction with the Simsbury Historical Society Garden Party, which this year will be a two-day event that will have, I don't know, a lot of stuff both days. Um, one thing that they're going to have is a Friends of the Forest Wigwam display. And one thing that I will have, which is a fun thing. That the Grange just got, that anybody is welcome to borrow, is our fun spinny wheel. So I got a bunch of prizes, and we I got a whole bunch of books and prizes, and I had a bunch of brain paraphernalia and all kinds of stuff. And then anybody can spin. You don't have to get it around one time. The kids absolutely love it. Their favorite thing is spin again. So that's <laughs> So if anyone wants to borrow it, it's all customizable. You're welcome to, and you can spin it yourself on June 8th. I think that's it on my list. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Great, thank, thank you, Susan. Sue. If you send me the information on the concert series, I'd like to include that oh, okay. in my thank report. You. Awesome. That's how we did the budget. <laughs> <laughs> I'll loan it to you next year. Don't let them know. <laughs> Anybody else uh, for public audience? Today? All right. Thanks, Susan. Uh, we've got two presentations. Our first one tonight is on the hazard mitigation plan for the region. Um, staff reviewed the plan and the consultant has incorporated uh, feedback into the plan that concerns Simsbury. Uh, 
Dave Murphy with Malone and McBroom will present the update. And after the presentation, if the Board of Selectmen is supportive, we can adopt the plan. By adopting the plan, it opens Simsbury up to federal grant opportunities. So. Oh, sure. Oh, is that driving you crazy? The is raging right now. Just like bouncing around. Yeah, it's like, oh, is that what it is, Chris? Yeah. I think it's... Oh, uh, there we go. All right. Thanks, Chris. Have a rattle down here. <laughs> Can't hear anything other than that. Folks, right. ready? Yes, please. Okay, David Murphy from my loan room. We've been involved with the update of the Capital Region Hazard Mitigation Plan. This is the town's third time participating in the plan. Time has really flown. We were here about a year ago to do a briefing for the Board of Selectmen when you were new, Maria, I believe. Were you new about a year ago? Yes, I, I think that was my very first meeting, actually. Okay, all right. So we, we had some similar slides at that point in time, and then we also had a public meeting in Simsbury, so some of you may have seen these slides before, so I think that will allow me to go a little bit quickly. Go ahead. There we go. So we'll just quickly touch on the purpose and need for the hazard mitigation plan. Why are we doing this for the third time? And will we do it more? How can the plan be used? What hazards are included in the plan? What are some of the hazard mitigation strategies that we consider in these planning documents? What are some mitigation successes from the region? Um, and why does it matter? What are the proposed actions for Simsbury? And then what are the next steps? So the Disaster Mitigation Act of 2000 is what really got hazard mitigation planning underway in the United States. Um, and this is really a way for FEMA to streamline its disbursements of, of funds for hazard mitigation, also to cut down on what it costs all of us to sort of recover after disasters occur. It costs a lot of money to, you probably submitted public assistance reimbursements in the past, the town has, for example, after the winter storm of 2011, very costly. So mitigation is to reduce those costs. Also to help reduce uh, damage to property and loss of life, we're lucky in Connecticut not to have a lot of loss of life from hazards, but it does occur. There are three funding programs that the town is eligible for as a result of participating in this plan. There's the three last bullets in the slide, pre-disaster mitigation, flood mitigation assistance, and hazard mitigation grant program. And the town actually has some experience with some of those grant programs. Unlike other towns in the region, you're actually using uh, the plan to get grants. Go ahead. So the plan is covering natural hazards. So these are extreme natural events, tornadoes, flood, uh, hurricanes. You can see the photos in the bottom, self-explanatory. So mitigation, that's actions that we take ahead of time to reduce our losses. So if we elevate new construction or if we remove a building from a floodplain, that will help us avoid damage that is very costly to recover from. This, these are some graphics. Actually, these are relatively new. Last year we had last year's version. And I think it's very compelling to see on the right-hand side, especially the top five mitigation project types that FEMA funds in the United States. Acquisitions means acquiring property at risk. Flood control means like dams, dikes, berms, flood walls. Elevations is elevating buildings. Utility infrastructure protection is like protecting a road from erosion or water or sewer main and then safe room. We really don't deal with that in Connecticut. Number five is a tornado alley thing. But what I wanted to say is the infrastructure uh, category has moved up relative to last year. That benefits states like Connecticut because that's really one of the categories that we do best with is protecting infrastructure because we're a very highly developed state. As you can imagine, we don't really do a lot of business and flood control. We did that in the 1950s and we're not doing a lot of acquisitions here. We don't have towns along the Mississippi River. So that category four on the right hand side, very pleased to say that's moving up in funding. Go ahead. So grants can be used for building acquisitions, elevations, the things we just talked about in the previous slide, replacing culverts, drainage projects, riverbank stabilization, landslide. It sounds crazy, but I've actually worked on a landslide project funded by FEMA. Um, and then less commonly in this part of the country, wind retrofits seismic, we really don't see that sort of thing. Um, the last bullet on there, standby power supplies, otherwise known as generators. Everybody loves a generator. They are still eligible. They weren't 10 years ago. Who knows 10 years from now whether, whether they will be, but we're happy right now that the grants can pay for generators. This is an example of a project um, in Western Mass that we worked on that was funded by FEMA, Public Works Garage, your classic small town public works garage right at the edge of a river, where else would we put it? <laughs> right after Hurricane Irene, the Public Works Garage, they almost lost all the equipment. It was gonna slide out the back into the river. So FEMA helped pay for a riverbank stabilization 
that was a little bit different than just hastily putting back gravel, which would wash out again. So we're covering the same hazards in the plan as five years ago, um, and they're listed right there. If you do the advance, the slide advance, I think there's an animation. Yep. So we are required by FEMA and by state statute to uh, address climate change and how it affects the hazards that it does affect, which is the most of the, the hazards on that list in the orange box. We'll go through these one at a time. I believe I have slides for these one at a time. Nope, I took them out. We did that a year ago, and I thought <laughs> you didn't need to hear it again. But we can, we can go back and talk about them if you want to. So we're going to jump right into the hazard mitigation strategies. There are six categories that these plans typically speak of. <clears throat> Um, and I think, you know, the six, you know, the, there's one larger blurb, public education, which encompasses everything. But the five smaller circles in that, fairly self-explanatory. So natural resource protection is like buying up open space. Emergency services, making sure that you can get to your public works garage during a flood. The one that's kind of not really self-explanatory, I think, is prevention. It doesn't mean preventing the flood. It means preventing the damage. So building codes is a classic example of prevention. Go ahead. So here are some examples of successes from the region. Uh, FEMA has a really hard time understanding that we do mitigation in the Northeast. You know, they're really kind of used to the Midwest and California wildfire situations. So it's important to show them that it is really going on. Um, believe it or not, Plainville is our kind of favorite example of property acquisitions. 21 properties have been acquired near the Pequabic River. Go ahead. Uh, you've probably all seen this. Even right now, I think the river's back up. The Hartford Boathouse is wet flood proof, so after the flood um, comes down, you can just hose it out and use it the next day. Uh, drainage upgrades had some pictures I was fortunate to find or take uh, last year in New Britain. This, is, this one's kind of hard to see, but your neighbor, Farmington, uh, replaced a culvert to reduce flooding on the right-hand side of the photo on the right. Uh, low impact development um, can, can be classified as mitigation because if you do a lot of it, it can reduce flooding. Uh, Mansfield has some pretty robust uh, low impact development regulations. Uh, Parkville, uh, near where I live in West Hartford, this is just down the road about a mile or two away, has a fuel cell. I think those are pretty cool. So there's a collection of buildings in Parkville, um, community center, library, senior center. But what's really interesting is the grocery store is connected. So why would someone you know, attach a building that's privately owned. Well, you know, you've heard of this term food desert in urban environments, right? You, you need to have a place to get food. There's no place else. There's not a stop and shop around the corner with its own generator. So a little collection of buildings that has a redundant power supply. Uh, South Windsor's EOC, they say, uh, has a very strong roof. We'll see. <laughs> next time. Uh, it's been a long day. Uh, and then the uh, hazard <coughs> mitigation uh, can be posted, tips can be posted to town's websites. I think we have West Hartford and Windsor. It's a little hard for me to see. There's a lot of good floodplain information up there, so that counts as public education. Um, so we'll just, we'll jump into the mitigation actions for Simsbury. Uh, we were pleased to dispose of many of the actions in the previous plan because you had completed them or they were already capabilities. That's really good news. So we had to come up with a lot of new actions for you. Um, just to make sure you had a lot of meat in the plan in case you wanted to apply for grants. So we, you had about 25 actions last time. You still have about 25 actions, even though about half of them are retired. There's probably about 12 or 13 new actions. Some were carried forward. So I'm not going to go through all of them. I've got about six slides of actions, but this first slide kind of gives you most of the flood-related actions. So we have actions involving different roads that flood from the Farmington River, some streams that flood with some small culverts, um, so th this, this first set of six bullets, these actions are very flood related. Um, and we can go back to this, but go on to the next slide. This next one continues some of the flood related actions, but you can see we kind of segue into some other types of categories. The last two bullets are actually wildfire related. We've got one about looking at some vulnerable areas and doing a needs assessment. And then we have uh, the last action that involves having some fire suppression sources nearby. And we've got a collection of actions um, having to do with power, redundant power, and protecting power. We've got two actions on repetitive loss properties, which are the properties that have had two or more flood losses and claims made under the National Flood Insurance Program. And the town of Simsbury actually is, um, has the honor of having a lot of repetitive loss properties in the capital region, I think more than, you're, you're in the higher end of the list. 
-hmm. Now, it doesn't mean that you have the most flood loss. It means you have the m more people who buy flood insurance and make claims. There could be towns where people own their homes outright, don't have a mortgage, don't have flood insurance, they don't get on the list. So don't, it's not a, it's not a, uh, it's not so cut and dry as a, a measure of loss overall. Um, we've got a tree maintenance uh, action, which is usually appropriate in most towns. We've got one about a fuel cell, which is why I wanted that fuel cell example to be in there at the Simsbury High School. Look at the costs and benefits of doing that. Go ahead. We've got some regulation updates, some uh, regulations ordinance type work just to tighten up some things. Um, we've got a couple of actions that come from state initiatives. One of them, the third bullet, is small businesses. DEP is very concerned with small businesses when they flood. Pollutants are released. They would like to see less of that happening. Um, we've got a bullet that was just a gift to you, Mike, because you do participate in the Flood Association conferences and training. So you're already completing that second to last bullet. And then we've got something in the bottom about stormwater, everyone's favorite topic. Next slide. We've got your something that you've been working on for a little while, I think, in town, a drought ordinance to sort of revisit that if wanted. Only if wanted. These are not mandates. This is a menu. Oh, we have that one. <laughs> Trust <Okay>. me. <coughs> um, <laughs> John's got it in his pocket. He knows yeah. it's He's got it. All right. I'd be yeah. happy to get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> And, and then we've got some other <laughs> some other <laughs> statewide kind of initiatives. The state is very interested in towns joining the FEMA CRS program. That's the second bullet. That's the optional program to reduce flood insurance premiums. We've got everyone's favorite, the sustainable CT program, which the state would like towns to look at entering. Why does it matter? Its sustainability is not the same as mitigation. There are some actions that are in both programs. We've got a couple actions on historic resources. This is because our state historic preservation office is very concerned with flooding of historic resources right now. Um, and they wanted to see actions in the plan as well. So we, we said yes to a lot of our state agencies, even though we don't always say yes to them. And we said, sure, we'll incorporate some of your mitigation actions. I think the next slide is the last slide. And that is that um, you have a resolution in front of you. I can talk about it if you'd have any questions. Um, but you'll be eventually signing that, the town clerk signs it as well, and then that gets returned to the Capital Region Council of Governments, uh, and we'll package them all together and get the plan back to FEMA. But right now it has conditional approval. Um, FEMA is okay with the plan as it, as it is. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Could, thank you. Could we have had your help with the Betty Hudson project years ago relative to acquiring that property and removing it? I mean, that would be something that fell, fell yeah, under? I know about Okay. The, end, the endless Betty Hudson project. So we, I, I'm a little bit familiar with it. So it, um, having been in the plan is what made you eligible for applying for that grant. Um, what kind of went sideways on that project is is kind of unrelated to the plan. Um, the plan makes you eligible to be even in the running to acquire it. Mm -hmm. okay. so, sec look, second was actually notes on there as well the tree mitigation. So we actually are incurring a significant cost in town taking down all of our ash trees that we constantly every year battle each other, understanding we have a need there, but it's it's a necessary evil and all. Those to me are trees that ultimately could be, pose a threat during a natural disaster. Absolutely. Okay, they come that. down, impede emergency vehicles, all that. Is that not something we could get assistance with to fund the removal of so we stop putting on the taxpayer's burden? It's it's difficult to, we put, the, we put everything in the plan because like I said, 10 years ago, generators weren't eligible and now they are. Right now, tree maintenance is not eligible. It's not on FEMA's list, um, but it's an important it's an important way to mitigate hazards and hazard hazard losses. So, um, you wouldn't apply for something like that. Um, that isn't to say that you couldn't apply a few other grant programs. I mean, like just one that springs to mind is um, assistance to firefighters. We use it as, as an example often of a grant program that is that towns will use for fire wildfire related actions i'm not saying that's related to what you're talking about but there are other grant programs that it may fit in with not those three that we saw in the first slide though not right now so the answer is no but we keep it in the plan because one day it may be eligible well, i hope so i mean get creative with it because it, much of this stuff is all certainly from a novice perspective um it has all equal value but very little visual understanding to most of us out there yet the trees to some to us are something that we talk about right. yearly mm -hmm. and they're visual to our residents coming down and, and we've we've identified them as a hazard mm -hmm. and i don't think it'd be a hard step to take it further that during a tropical storm yeah they would be 
more than just a hazard. We hope that they're eligible one day. I mean, there, there were years past where um, bearing power lines was eligible, which is sort of the parallel, right, to that. But now that's not. So, you know, it all kind of changes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, other questions? Um, one quick one. On the generator projects, is that um, available to, like, schools or Critical facilities. Public? So right. not schools, just Those schools could be. Oh, they would so be. So especially if a school is a shelter. If a shelter. school is a shelter. Yeah. Yeah. Or what we're hearing a lot these days is comfort stations, heating, cooling stations. Right. So not really a shelter, but. Well, I was thinking like we use our library as a as a cooling station, or we use our housing authority as a shelter, an emergency shelter. Right. Would those type of things be eligible? And we probably put those in the list of critical facilities. So well, I'll never be able to read the map, but I have a table. Um, yeah, we went on a generator binge a couple of years ago, though. Yeah, we mentioned that in here. <laughs> I can't find that right now, but critical facilities is where the where, where generators right. are eligible. Okay, thank you. Not only did we buy generators, but we upgraded the power or the hookups at a bunch of buildings too to make them even more effective, right? And we can move them around, so. I hope we captured that in the plan. Yeah. But table 26-10, annualized in, average annualized loss Simsbury drought zero. That was interesting. Yeah, because the, so the drought, Let's see if I can find We've protected drought. ourselves, Sean. It's the 100 year drought is coming, Sean. I'm just We're messing just, with these guys. Just, this is just the aggressive what? protection of ourselves with an ordinance that saved yes, us. That's right. This was before the ordinance. This is a. This is a question that I think we can answer at a, a staff level. What's the what's the process for taking these 25 items and really over the next uh, number of years? How are they prioritized and? And, and how does that work well, at a staff level? So let me just, sure. what's really nice about these plans is since you have to do it every five years, ah. um, you don't, you're never going to get 25 things done in five years. You always aim high. And then if you get five or 10 so done, and then in five years, you can brush them off and decide. But with that, I'll turn it over to. I think some of the actions that Dave uh, mentioned earlier on the previous slide, we've actually completed. We're, we're unlike some communities, ahead of the curve. No. Um, just just some of the years since last we met on this. I mean, for example, the drought ordinance, um, the uh, other few other items that we completed on the Sustainable Connecticut, we are participating, mm -hmm. exploring and participating. Okay. So we have some items to cut. There's other things that are identified as high priorities, which are stuff that um, staff is looking at. For example, uh, one was examining the uh, protection berm or dike around the Water Pollution Control Authority facility. That's something that is an activity that will be funded and, and received in, in the coming years. So another activity we're, we're on top of. I mean, I think for the most part, we went over our last group of activities. Right. Like you said, we retired and mainly because we were you had done able so to, much. We were able to check right. off. I mean, we've been right. one thing that I have to say for this community. We do a great job at uh, hazard planning and mitigation efforts. So yeah. we'll just continue what we're doing. Great. Other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion effective May 13th, uh, 2019 to approve the attached certificate of adoption for the Capital Region Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan update 2019 to 2024? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. That motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next presentation is from the Simsbury Meadows Performing Arts Center, which is interested in building permanent sound towers on the property, and they've identified a person who is willing to make the donation. Uh, Linda, you want to come on up? Linda Schofield is uh, the president of their board, and she'll be sharing some background on the project. You can do it this. Anyone on my board will tell you my technology skills are lacking, so. <laughs> the less I have to touch a computer, the happier I am. <laughs> um, and actually, let me, thank you for um, having us. And let me introduce a few, a few of our board members are here. Dave Ryan, um, Bob Hensley, Ferg Jansen, and our executive director, Missy DeNuno. And uh, the project manager for, for this particular project is Mark Deming. Um, happens to be my husband. <laughs> <laughs> He does good work. He does. <laughs> so, um, uh, so for uh, efficiency, we're hoping that we can get three things done at this meeting. One is to uh, authorize Maria to forward our application to the zoning um, commission. 
The second is to uh, grant us fee waivers for the Zoning Commission and the building permit when we get to that point. And then last, um, to give us conditional support for accepting the completed project as a gift um, contingent upon the zoning um, application being approved and the building permit and the building being done. So why do we want to do sound towers? So I, I, I did write up a lot of this in the uh, letter that you got, but sort of go over it quickly. When, um, when the town handed this facility to um, the nonprofit that was created in order to run it and take it off of your hands, um, it was always intended to be a facility in a couple of phases. Phase one was to build the band shell that you see there now, and phase two was to add numerous things to it. Phase two never happened. Um, and that makes it, quite frankly, um, a challenge financially for us to, um, to run the facility because it doesn't have everything it should have in order to be a facility that's attractive to promoters um, and users uh, of the place. And it means that we have to rent a bunch of stuff uh, in order to make it functional. Um, so in the what we've been trying to do over the last few years is um, slowly replace some of those rented um, things with permanent assets to lower our annual uh, operating costs so that it's a, a little easier for us to break even or do better at the end of the year. So uh, in that interest, you know, we've bought chairs, we've built the, the, the ticket booth, um, and the next thing on our list to do was to put in permanent sound towers. Um, we still have several other things we will need to do uh, in order to truly have phase two, because we'll still be renting trailers for dressing rooms and bathrooms for the performers and the like. And uh, we've certainly talked with Maria, who's been very supportive, and Eric about wanting eventually to have bathrooms for the public as well. Um, but in the meanwhile, lowering our rental cost is, you know, a significant uh, uh, goal to improve our financial viability and uh, make us better able to um, continue attracting performers. Um, the equipment, uh, which is just the sound towers, it's not actually the speakers because each performer tends to bring their own equipment that they get hung, so it's really just an infrastructure for <laughs> hanging the speakers. Um, but between the cost of the speakers rental itself and then the cost of labor to install them and then deconstruct them and carry them away at the end of the year, at the end of the season, that's about $18,000 a year. So that would go straight to our bottom line and be a very significant um, help to us financially. Um, so um, what are the advantages of permanent sound towers? Well, obviously the finances are a big part of it. Um, but with the new design, they're actually a little bit less climbable. I know Tom had been concerned about um, teenagers climbing on, on them. We've actually never had anybody do that that we know of. Um, but uh, the, the way that this will be designed is that the, the first rung, so to speak, that you could, could try to climb up is 15 feet in the air. So it's actually um, more difficult to climb than, than what we rent currently. Um, we have talked with uh, HSO and also their sound and light people and other users of the facilities. And um, if you've been to concerts at fancy places, you know they have video screens on either side so that if you're not sitting real close, you can still see the performers. And so um, we're trying to make these sound towers uh, have the ability to uh, hang a video screen as well. Uh, so that will make us a little more attractive to um, other concerts and, and a lot more attractive to the HSO. They're very excited about that that possibility. Um, and uh, there there would be no maintenance um, for these they, where we've asked the engineer to design, if at all possible, using um, metal uh, that's What's the word? Galvanized. Galvanized. Thank you, my expert over there. Um, <laughs> so that it doesn't need painting and uh, you know doesn't rust and will just stay in place. So um, it you know really once it's up, it's it's there for a very very long time. Um, and obviously we wouldn't need to be putting it up and taking it down every year. Um, Maria had asked us to talk about um, timelines. I mean timelines are very hard to predict with you know, all sorts of steps to have to take, but the steps are, you know, assuming approval today, um, we've actually already put out the um, 
engineers' specs to uh, several fabricators. Um, we're waiting for them to get us bids so that we know how much it would cost to do the, the metal work. There's a little bit of um, concrete work as well. Um, once we have all of the necessary approvals, um, which includes zoning, uh, then we need to go back to our donor, um, finalize um, an agreement with him to give us the money, um, and then engage the concrete work and the fabricator and hopefully get it all installed by uh, October because our donor is very strongly concerned about wanting to make the donation for a completed project this year. Mm. So any questions? I've got a whole team there <laughs> to help answer. Any questions? The, um, thank you. Uh, um, so the structure is, is unto itself. I mean, I'm trying to visualize it through the plans and all. Oh, but I kind of wish there so was if like you a, go to the next. Is there, is there like a, like a mock-up of what the visual from the front? Yeah. I saw that. Yeah, Bob, thank you. And I oh. saw that. But is it like, like a... Just sort of a rendering of what we, if we're ground view out on the, no, well, this, okay. This is just the ones that are in here then. Yeah. This yeah. is just a blow up of it, but this essentially was designed to conform with the requirements of the people that bring the speakers and the lights, uh, number one, and also to mimic some of the steel work that is on the stage. So mm -hmm. mimic, visually mimic it? Tie it together to a certain extent. The material yeah, used. but it's an open structure, though. It's, it's an a, open it's, it's structure. It's not, it's not, it, it, we want yeah. it as invisible in base, as possible. It's about 30, 34 feet high, and it's designed to be able to carry the weight of the speakers, um, and it pretty much mimics the structures that are rented every year, which is about okay. 12 by 12. Yeah. And will the base have like the, the continue in the front of the? stage is that nice sort of sandstone or red sandstone yeah you know Will that be the same along it, the it won't be i um i had originally thought we might want to put stone there and so bill clegg who is on our board and yeah, was no the bill. original project manager and designer of of the stage um he his feeling was from a design perspective you want it to be as invisible as possible mm -hmm. and that by putting stone on it you'd call attention to it okay. so he preferred to make it less visible <coughs> mm -hmm. and mostly what you'll see yeah, during concerts in, is the speakers in, this is the yeah. existing slab and we have to put in footings these are only about 10 inches high but three foot by three foot so mm -hmm. you have four new ones on each one and then these are anchored to the base and then they would be anchored to the to the seal yes how high is the top of the banjo now well, the the stage, you know, how yeah, like how the high is the whole? The I think it's a little bit. Yeah. I think it's taller than the. Little so it's going to be taller than the top. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I don't okay. know how much. I'm just trying to picture the line across the top. That's. Yeah. Well, and they're offset to the side. They're not directly in front of the stage, mm -hmm. if you remember. Mm -hmm. They're you know, those yeah, cement back. things mm -hmm. are a little out yeah, to the side because you don't want to block the view. Of yeah. the stage. I mean, without speakers and without the banners on these, you can barely see them. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's the intent. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The metal basically They're transparent. Four right. by six steel. Yeah. So it's, yeah. It's, it's a no, lot it's less than what they rent. Or yeah. Here, which yeah. Well, those with the cross. Is about. Yeah. A foot yeah. You won't have all those trusses there, right. so it will be less. You know. Yeah, I think it's. I was. Really impactful. That's all I wanted to hear, yeah. so the public can hear the fact that these are towers. I was like, you know, they're going to be stone towers, but the fact that they're essentially going to be see-through yeah that, that's yeah. the that's yeah. the intent yeah now this makes a ton of sense i'm, I'm really pleased to see this thank you for the work on yep. it this is awesome thank you hey, other thank questions you. okay um thanks linda okay um is there a, a motion effective uh, may 13th 2019 to authorize the town manager to sign applications related to the proposed sound towers for the simsbury meadows performing arts center facility on behalf of the town of simsbury so moved Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Any opposed? That motion carries. Is there a motion effective <coughs> May 13th, 2019 to approve the request for the fee waivers corresponding to the proposed sound towers for the Simsbury Meadows Performing Arts Center facility subject to design approval by Land Use Commissions? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And that motion carries. And um, also your request was that we provide tonight the conditional approval uh, to accept the donation should it, you know, make its way through the land use so process. Coming back um, more time. <laughs> would, that, would that be something others would feel comfortable doing tonight? I mean, sure. it makes sense to me. As long as they're comfortable to conditions that yeah. donor right. set forth, yep. then I'm fine taking them as experts mm -hmm. in it. Just, okay. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Now, just the, just the setup says approval of what we just approved would be providing that conditional support. I'm just mentioning the language that's in the um, yeah, I was actual motions. So do we need an, an additional motion, or is it just de facto done at this point? My reading of this was that by making these motions, we are, yes, in essence, right. in, mm -hmm. you know, supporting yep. the donation. I just I didn't know if mm -hmm. the Performing Arts Center would want a formal motion. Yeah, Dave. The auditors would like a vote that says, yes, you will accept the donation. Our, okay. our auditors. Um, <laughs> we still have to leave room for the land use boards to do, if they have yeah. any changes or conditions that need to be that. met, yeah. that so why don't we I, might have to come back. But sure. Why don't I uh, attempt a motion? We can see if it works. Uh, would there be a motion uh, to give our conditional support to accept the donation for the sound towers uh, pending approval uh, by the land use bodies? I'll move that. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. I think that's good. I'll second it. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And that motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for being here. Today. Thanks, guys. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Okay, moving on to the first selectman's report. A reminder that the 2019-2020 uh, uh, budget referendum is taking place tomorrow. That's Tuesday, May 14th at Henry James Middle School. Polls open at 6 a.m. and close at 8 p.m. You can learn more about the proposed budget on our budget information page. The easiest way to get there is just to go to the home page of the town website, and it's the first, uh, first thing that, click, that opens up in the middle. Um, we have a, a budget fact sheet which provides an overview of key changes and some of the budget drivers. The bottom line, we're proposing a budget that maintains core services and would increase the mill rate at just under 2.5%. That's less than $200 for a median priced home. I've received many questions about the Board of Selectmen's operating budget, which is increasing about 14%. Um, mo most of that increase is driven by an accounting change that is intended to improve uh, transparency in budgeting where a number of items uh, were moved in there that ultimately the town is reimbursed for. Um, we've explained, um, I, I think the, the budget mailer um, does not explain that change. We've attempted to explain it on, um, on Facebook. I've explained it to uh, people who've uh, reached out to me with questions, and I just don't think we can overstate it, um, that it's not truly a 14% increase. Uh, and, and again, I, I think most people um, have been understanding and, and appreciative of that nuance once we were able to explain it. Um, throughout this process, the Board of Selectmen uh, worked hard to balance our residents' expectations for services with the need to keep our taxes in check. Uh, the Town of Simsbury, American Legion Post 84, and the Veterans of Foreign Wars Post 1926 are organizing two Memorial Day parades on May 27th. The Terrafield Parade marches along Winthrop Street and starts at 9 a.m., followed by a ceremony at St. Bernard Cemetery. The Simsbury Parade starts at 1.30, and as usual, it proceeds along Hot Meadow Street from Owensbrook Boulevard to the library. There'll be a ceremony on the uh, Simsbury Veterans Memorial following the parade, and the theme is the 75th anniversary of D-Day. We'll be recognizing our World War II veterans, and scouts will tell stories of five of Simsbury's World War II veterans who died in service. The Hometown Hero Committee met on May 6th uh, to review nominations and made award recipient selections. Um, because there was a conflict with the Burgers on the Bridge event, we wouldn't dare compete with that. The annual Hometown Hero Ceremony is going to be held on Monday, June 10th at 5 p.m. in the main meeting room of Town Hall, just before our regularly scheduled meeting. Some preliminary site work has begun on the Tobacco Valley Solar Project, a 26 megawatt solar farm off of Hoskins and County Road. On March 28th of 2019, the Connecticut Siting Council approved the development and management plan. The town reviewed the DNM plan and de determined that it conforms uh, to the agreement that the town negotiated with the project's developer. According to the DNM plan, the project is anticipated to be completed in about eight months. At our next meeting on May 29th, uh, Planning Director Mike Glidden and Town Engineer Jeff Shea will be providing the Board of Selectmen with a more detailed update on what to expect. May is Bike Month, and I'd like to highlight uh, a couple of uh, bike slash walk to school days. May 14th is Latimer Lane, that is tomorrow, and June 7th is Squadron Line. 
You can find the full lineup of Bike Month's events at simsbury.bike. Um, my full first selectman's report has, uh, it arrives um, every two weeks by email. I have a more comprehensive listing of things happening throughout the summer, uh, some at the Performing Arts Center, some uh, other places around town. You can sign up for that. Uh, for anyone who's not, by going to the homepage of the town website, you can click on subscribe to news, and from there you can determine what you want to subscribe to. So once you get to the town website, it's two easy clicks. And I'll turn now to Maria with the town manager's report. Thank you. Good evening. Under Board of Selectmen Business, um, thank you, Eric, for such a good overview of the upcoming referendum. Um, the budget mailer was delivered last week. Uh, and upon receipt, uh, we were receiving quite a few questions about the 14% increase. Um, so we quickly turned around a one-page fact sheet to explain some of those accounting changes, some of the fund transfers um, that made up a large portion of what appears to be the 14% increase. Uh, it was important to us that that fact sheet would be considered content neutral. Uh, we did have both the town attorney and state elections enforcement review the document and they felt comfortable with what was presented. That information is now available on the town's website under our budget information section. Um, it would encourage folks who uh, may want to understand the significant budget drivers and sort of the details behind uh, the proposed budget to take a look at that fact sheet. The quarterly budget status report is complete. Uh, the Board of Finance did review that at their last meeting. Um, we will be reviewing that with you at your upcoming May 29th meeting. Uh, Amy is currently on vacation, which is why we've pushed out your review just one meeting. Uh, but if you are interested in seeing those materials sooner than your May 29th packet, that was included in the Board of Finance packet from their April 23rd meeting. And I've provided a link um, so you can do that if you'd like to do that prior to the next meeting. Uh, regarding your referral of the delegation of open space stewardship and land management duties um, from the Conservation Commission to open space, uh, the Conservation Commission is still working on their response to that referral. Um, as soon as we have that information available, we will report back to you at a future meeting. And I have some good news to report from the Economic Development Commission. Um, they continue to meet. They continue to work on the action items that you've set forth for them. And under the goal of business recruitment, retention, and outreach, uh, the EDC and I have been working on what we're calling a business roundtable concept. Um, we're going to pilot the concept in June. Um, the plan is to, uh, on a quarterly basis, invite a small group of business owners um, to meet with us and to basically you know, ask them and discuss what's working well, what do they like about doing business with the town, what don't they like about doing business with the town, um, what can we do as a town to help their business grow and prosper in our community. Um, and we're hoping to gather feedback from those small group settings, um, again, as we move forward with other action items, and again, just helping us to continually improve and, and do better, but also to, you know, maintain a connection to our business community. So we are going to be pilot, piloting that in June, and if it goes well, we'll plan to do that on a quarterly basis moving forward. Under departmental news and notes, the library, uh, for the second year in a row, they have been honored by their professional association for the Excellence in Public Library Service Award. Um, they were recognized for our Teen Job Center. Um, the primary staff members on that are Teen Services Librarian, Sarah Ray, and actually our business resource librarian position, which is currently vacant, um, but was formerly held by Sarah Laudeschlager. So many, many thanks to them and uh, job well done. Well done, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. For the police department, uh, we recently received a couple of donations that don't necessarily reach the threshold that need Board of Selectmen approval, but just wanted to recognize what those were. Um, the Simsbury Women's Club has donated $1,200 uh, to go towards women's self-defense training classes, so we're very grateful to them for that. And we also recently had a $500 donation from a uh, community member, Rosemary Smith. She participated in our uh, annual Citizens Academy program and was just so moved by the experience um, that she has provided a donation for our cadet program and continuing education of our officers. So many, many thanks to those folks. Uh, as some of you may know, um, we participate uh, in the National Drug Take Back Day. Um, we have a box available to the public 24 hours a day where folks can drop off their prescription medications that they no longer need. Uh, and within the last year, we collected 1,400 pounds of medication and were able to dispose of that safely and properly. So that, again, is a service that's available um, and folks can drop off their medications that they no longer need at the drop box in the lobby of our police department here in this building. 
For Culture, Parks, and Recreation, uh, we want to invite you to join us at Stratton Brook Park on Friday, May 31st from 10 a.m. to noon. Uh, Connecticut Deep and the Connecticut Greenways Council are holding their 20th annual Connecticut Greenways Awards and National Trail Celebration. Um, as part of this event, uh, Simsbury will be recognized for our bicycle efforts, particularly the efforts of our uh, Bicycle Advisory Committee and our recent designation um, as a silver designation for our bicycle-friendly community, um, which was awarded by the League of American Bicyclists. Um, so folks are encouraged to bring their own chair and we look forward to seeing you at the event. Uh, lastly, Community and Social Services will be sponsoring a program called Hidden in Plain Sight. Um, this comes to us from the Connecticut Association of Prevention Professionals. Um, this is to uh, help parents um, learn uh, signs uh, that their teens may be using drugs or alcohol. And what this will entail is there will be uh, essentially a bedroom, a mock bedroom set up, and parents will be able to learn common items um, that are commonly concealed and how those might be concealed. Um, it will be followed by a presentation to help parents, um, again, see the warning signs of risky behaviors and also how to initiate conversations with their children if, if they are concerned. Um, that program will be held on June 6th from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Simsbury Public Library. It is open to the public, but adults only. Uh, light refreshments will be provided and that's free to attend. Thank you. Great, thank you. Moving on to uh, selectman action. Item A is tax refund requests. Is there a motion effective May 13th, 2019 to approve the presented tax refunds in the amount of $2,441.98 and to authorize town manager Maria Capriola to execute the tax refunds? So, second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> okay, that motion carries. Uh, item B is um, the uh, regarding the public hearing we had uh, earlier this evening. Uh, the Board of Selectmen recently formed a work group to review our current ordinance that provides tax abatements to our volunteer firefighters and EMTs. There were three clarifying changes that the work group has proposed to be made to the ordinance. Um, two of those I would describe as largely administrative. One was a bit more substantive, uh, and that was to eliminate the benefit for residents who live in Simsbury but provide service to another community. Uh, appreciate Sean and uh, and Chris uh, for serving on uh, this work group from the Board of Selectmen. Is there anything that either of you wanted to add? Um, I mean, I think we both support these changes. You know, they are very much administrative in nature. Well, you know, as Kevin articulated at the podium, one of them was, was merely an oversight. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable approving these this evening. Okay. Any, um, were there any other questions before we vote? Okay. Is there a motion effective May 13th, 2019 to adopt the proposed revisions to the volunteer firefighter and ambulance personnel tax abatement ordinance, Article 5, Chapter 141, as presented, which will be effective 21 days after publication in a newspaper having circulation within the town of Sinsbury? And uh, further, uh, is there a motion to authorize a summary of the adopted ordinance be published? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Uh, item C is a, uh, a proposed grant application uh, through the U.S. Department of Justice, which would provide 50% of the cost of purchasing bulletproof vests for our police officers. The current request supports the purchase of 20 vests. Uh, is there a motion effective May 13th, 2019 to submit the fiscal year 1920 bulletproof vest partnership grant application and authorize Maria Capriola, town manager, to execute the grant application um, and to accept the grant if it is awarded. So moved. Second. Is there any uh, questions or conversation? Were you going to, I'm sorry. Were you gonna, I couldn't tell if that, I couldn't tell if that was a hand. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Thank you. Uh, well, item D. <laughs> Uh, is a uh, proposed donation uh, from Simsbury Bank for the cadet program. Uh, Simsbury Bank has generously offered to donate $4,000 to support the cadet program. The program allows students to observe how the Simsbury Police Department operates. Uh, is there a motion effective May 13, 2019 to accept the donation from Simsbury Bank in the amount of $4,000 to be used for the Simsbury Police Cadet Program in the Simsbury Police Department? So moved. Thank you. Uh, all in favor with our thanks. Aye. 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 Any opposed? And that motion carries. Thank you. 
Uh, item <coughs> E is um, we have two Neighborhood Assistance Act program proposals. So the Neighborhood Assistance Act uh, provides a tax credit to tax-exempt organizations that make a cash investment in qualifying community programs, uh, things like energy, conservation, job training, education, uh, crime prevention, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, the town manager's office received two proposals, one from the Simsbury Grange, the other from the Housing Authority, and a public hearing is required before we are able to approve those applications. Uh, is there a motion effective May 13th, 2019, to set a public hearing to receive comment on the proposals submitted by the Simsbury Grange and the Simsbury Housing Authority pursuant to the 2019 Connecticut Neighborhood Assistance Act for uh, 6 p.m. Wednesday, May 29th, 2019? So moved. Second. Any questions or conversation? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And that motion carries. Uh, the Simsbury Meadows Performing Arts Center is looking to build a roof structure addition uh, to the Performing Arts Center barn. This is an item that um, came to us previously. It would provide shelter for their 1,300 chairs. Currently, uh, the chairs have been placed under uh, a tarp, which hasn't been the most effective way of uh, protecting them from the elements. The Conservation Commission granted placement of the structure on the west side of the barn, which would be visible <laughs> from the parking lot, and that's different than um, the way it was described when it was initially presented. Is there any um, anything you wanted to add, Maria? Uh, no, I think you covered okay. it well. The, um, again, the proposal when it came at the end of January was for the lean-to structure to be on the back side of the barn, so it wouldn't be visible from the parking lot, uh, but wetlands requested the opposite. Other mm. questions, concerns? No, I, don't, I think it makes perfect sense. Mm. It would be nice to have it on the backside, but I understand, you know, what lands concerns. So, any Where's sec the security concerns with having them all visible from the parking lot? I mean, they're under they're under a tarp right now, aren't they? Yeah. So yeah. It's, yeah. So this is no it's worse than the tarp. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I understand it's an improvement, but they're just going to be sitting under the overhang. It's an improvement. We have cameras down. Where there. is the um, over there yesterday throwing a lacrosse ball against the building where the sign says "Don't do this"? But anyways, there, um, <laughs> That's good. where is the the tarp area right now? Back. It's in the back. It's in the back area where they, we don't want the semi-permanent structure. Right. So we've got a, we've got a non-visible but ugly, imperfect solution on the back side, and now, which although if we don't vote for this, it's going to stay like that, right? Tarped and on the wrong side in the wetlands. And okay, so thank yeah, you. That puts it more time. perspective for me then. Thanks for that clarification. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is there a motion uh, effective May 13th, 2019 to accept the donation of building a roof structure addition to the existing storage barn? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that motion passes. Um, item G is a proposed easement at 87 Riverside Road. Um, this is an interesting uh, uh, nugget. For many years, uh, Culture Parks and Rec has mowed the area east of the Flower Bridge along Riverside Road, even though a portion of the area um, has been, is, is a portion of the area is privately owned. It's not on town property. Um, last summer, the owner of 87 Riverside Road contacted the town manager's office and requested that a formal agreement be developed regarding the maintenance of the area. Um, Maria, could you just briefly describe the, the substance of the easement? Sure. So the easement would essentially be codifying the practice that has been in place for many, many years. Um, we would continue to uh, mow that small section of uh, privately owned land uh, adjacent to the flower bridge. Um, we have some flower beds that we maintain there. Uh, we have a bench uh, that is located there. Um, the property owner is comfortable with um, our guests of the flower bridge continuing to you know, use that bench um, and for us to continue to maintain the flower beds. So again, this would just provide us um, um, the access to do so. Uh, with this easement, in the event that that property is ever sold and, and changes ownership, that easement will remain with the property into the future. So I think that's a really valuable piece of this easement for us. Um, we would not be erecting any structures uh, with the exception of a small section um, of fencing uh, that would essentially help with safety and, and security reasons along the embankment that's there. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that <clears throat> covers the main items, unless Tom, you had anything you wanted to add? Okay. Yeah. 
It's a, it's a neat piece of property because when you look at it, you wouldn't know that it's not owned by the town because it looks like it fits into the, uh, into the park. Mm. Um, I, I guess I just wanted to express my appreciation to the homeowner for, yeah. for mm -hmm. granting, you know, being able to work with the town in this way. Um, is there anything anyone wanted to ask or add? I, I think it's a great example of the town and citizens, the Olsons, working together. That's what makes the town a town. Mm -hmm. and it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Is there a motion effective uh, May 13th, 2019, to refer the proposed uh, recreational area easement for the parcel at 87 Riverside Road as presented to the Planning Commission pursuant to Connecticut General Statute 18-24? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. That motion carries. Um, item H is a uh, proposed increase to the town manager's salary. Uh, the town manager's contract reflects an annual performance review and a salary adjustment process in which the salary of the town manager can be increased in line with the increase given to other non-unionized positions, assuming that the town manager receives a satisfactory performance review. In this case, the increase would be two and a quarter percent. At the last meeting of the personnel subcommittee, uh, we endorsed that increase. The financial impact on the town would be $722 for the remainder of the fiscal year. Uh, was there anything that either Sean or Chris wanted to add? Nope. Any questions from? I mean, I think this members? is. I mean, this is consistent with the other unaffiliated raises we give, and I think, um, you know, from a from a <clears throat> um, employer standpoint, as we've talked about before, it's it's important that we treat all of our employees in an equitable manner as best we can. And obviously, we have different bargaining units um, on the union side, but on the unaffiliated side, you know, we. Um, it, it didn't seem correct to leave one of our employees out, whether it was, um, you know, an accountant or a financer, you know, again, it didn't make sense to leave the town manager out. I think she's done a great job. We obviously gave her a strong review. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this is consistent with, um, again, with what we've done with other employees, so it makes sense. Any questions? Okay. Uh, thanks, Sean. Uh, is there a motion effective May 13th, 2019? Uh, that the town manager's salary be increased by two and a quarter percent consistent with the performance review process stipulated in the town manager's contract. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. That motion carries. Uh, moving on to appointments and resignations. Uh, the retirement plan subcommittee meets on a quarterly basis and according to the MOU that was recently established, the Board of Selectmen is responsible for providing recommendations to the Board of Finance for the community at large appointments. Uh, so that's the, the context of, of this first one. Um, is there a motion effective May 13th, 2019 to nominate Phil Schultz for appointment uh, by the Board of Finance uh, to the retirement plan subcommittee as a community member at large for a three-year term? So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Is there a motion to accept the uh, resignation of Paul McElhaney as a member of the Retirement Plan Subcommittee retroactive to April 30th, 2019? So move with our thanks. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, is there a motion effective May 13th, 2019 to appoint the following people to the 350th Anniversary Steering Committee? Diana Moody, representing the Simsbury Land Trust, and Jean Sumner, representing the Simsbury Women's Club. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. And is there a motion to accept the resignation of Dennis Kearns as a member of the Technology Task Force retroactive to April 18th, 2019? So moved. With our thanks. Yep. Yeah. Second. Thanks. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, review of the minutes. Uh, the first uh, was the regular meeting April 22nd. Any proposed changes? Um, any proposed changes to the special meeting uh, of April 26th? Okay. Then those minutes stand as presented. Are there any selectman liaison and subcommittee reports? I do have one to do indulge me absolutely <laughs> um it's a busy week for community for care but um on wednesday may 15th at 6 30 p.m the community for care will be presenting um a pro a community book read on the hate you give it's a young adult novel and we, the library has kindly made many copies available people have been reading it and discussing it and we are looking forward to holding a community 
Facebook group, so to speak. Um, the discussion will be moderated by um, Martha Bracken Harris. She is the former director of community outreach, for, re, outreach from the Renbrook School. Um, she's also an, an accomplished classroom teacher, administrator, and facilitator um, with regard to many educational communities. She discusses diversity in all its forms, and we are looking forward to her discussion on this book. Um, we would caution that this book is appropriate for mature middle schoolers, if that's, if that's a real word, but, um, and high school students and above, Thank you. and their parents. Um, the other is from the Aging and Disability Commission. On Thursday evening, they will be presenting a program, Legal Guidelines for Aging Well. Uh, the speaker will be attorney Claudia Inglesby from here in Simsbury. She will be talking about phases of retirement, components of a retirement plan, record keeping, um, planning for long-term care needs at home, uh, payer resources, what to do when your resources run out. Um, it should be a very informative program. It will be at the library and program room two, uh, beginning at 7 p.m. on Thursday. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sean. So despite my lower than average intelligence, um, the yes. <coughs> <laughs> just want to clarify a couple things from public audience. Obviously, the budget mailer is prescribed. Um, we have to be very careful with what's put in there, and it's, it's, it has to be very consistent. And again, it, as Maria mentioned, it goes through election enforcement and the town attorney. And a long, drawn-out explanation of accounting changes and et cetera is simply not appropriate for that mailer. That is the reason why in this community and in many others we have um, a budget process that starts at the end of February where we all get a 500-page document and we spend about 10 hours together and collectively this group has probably spent about 100 hours on the budget um, obviously out in public explanation um, et cetera et cetera so um, I enjoy the debate I enjoy the discussion but any notion that this budget wasn't um, discussed or, or disclosed in, in public or substantial information provided um, is simply obviously not true as, as we all know here um, I think Maria and and Melissa and Amy did an outstanding job of preparing it of making some very very complicated issues as simple enough for myself and and for those of us that are not in the financial world to understand them um, you know this is a hundred million dollar budget that this community oversees this is this is not a, uh, a you know a, a, a small nonprofit or something that you can do in a couple of lines and that's why, um, you know, it's it's particularly frustrating. And Joan, thank you, but Joan was one of the two people that actually showed up to the budget hearing to hear the explanation and to listen to the discussions. And while I appreciate that Facebook and other places are a means for the discussion, a little bit too late. Um, you know, we, we, we work really hard in this community to be transparent on the budget and to get information out there. So we've been having, I think, some very spirited and informative and, of course, neutral discussions on Facebook, not advocating for or against the budget. Uh, but again, three days before the referendum on Facebook with, with assumptions that the Board of Selectmen is giving themselves a raise or that spending is out of control or, you know, not productive. And uh, I think our community can do better. So I continue to encourage folks to reach out. I know I've received many emails and phone calls. I commend town staff for, for taking on that. But again, we lay it out here. And I know folks have better things to do with their time. Um, but I hope that if folks have concern with numbers or otherwise, there's a lot of us that can put you in touch with the facts. Um, draw your own conclusion whether they're fair numbers or not, but the facts, at the end of the day, I, I'm proud of the budget that we all endorsed and put together. Uh, potential 2.47 increase in this environment is, I believe, substantially lower than our communities surrounding us. I think it's, it, it's a pattern of fiscal discipline. We've had substantial challenges. Um, but again, it's one that uh, that I hope folks will come out and, and decide whether they agree with or disagree with tomorrow. So, well put. Thank, Thank you, Sean. You. Well said, Sean. Any other uh, liaison or subcommittee reports? Okay. Um, anything under communication that anyone wanted to bring up? It's a lovely letter to the representative and the senator. Well done, Maria. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so finally, is there a motion to adjourn to executive session with Bob DiCrescenzo, Maria Capriola, Melissa Appleby, Colleen O'Connor, and David Gardner to discuss items stemming from our town's tax sale policy? So moved. So moved. Uh, your second, Chris. All in favor? Aye. 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 <sighs> Thank you.
Yeah, this is the shaggiest I've ever seen. I was just noticing that. My favorite though. 